Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In a recent video, we talked about how the TIE Fighter, despite being a phenomenal starfighter, was just not a great fit for the Empire. Now granted, had the Empire maybe reduced the size of its fleet of Imperial class Star Destroyers, replaced it with more light cruisers, and skipped the Death Star altogether, that could have opened up the budget significantly for the TIE Defender program. But by the time Thrawn and Morgan Elsbeth had those fighters coming off of the assembly line on Lothal, it was already too little, too late. The year that spanned from the liberation of Lothal all the way to the Battle of Yavin 4 was full of a terrible series of incidents that set the Empire back in ways the military brass only began to understand years later at Endor. You go from losing your most brilliant Admiral Thrawn to losing your gigantic Death Star battle station. Which of course plunged the galactic economy into a deep, deep recession. But Emperor Palpatine was also stupid enough to place his best and brightest officers along with most of the military leadership on board of that thing as well. And to make matters worse, all of the best TIE fighter pilots in the Empire were also stationed on the Death Star. And get this, there were 7,300 TIE fighters on board. And let's say you had maybe three to four pilots per TIE fighter. You're talking about tens of thousands of your most elite fighter pilots dead and gone. Uh, these would have been the individuals uh, you would have put into those TIE Defenders if you ever got that program running. And the craziest thing about the Battle of Yavin was that Tarkin didn't even deploy any of those fighters until it was too late. If even 1% of the Starfighters on the Death Star were deployed before the Rebels arrived on station, there would be no Star Wars trilogy. Luke and Red Squadron would have died miles before they even reached the Death Star's gravitational pull. The only Imperials who did survive the destruction of the first Death Star were a handful of TIE fighter pilots deployed to stop Red Squadron by Vader. Losing a million plus Imperial personnel was a huge blow to the Empire. They didn't just lose TIE fighter pilots, they also lost some of their best bridge officers as well. And as the Galactic Civil War started in earnest, and the Rebels carried out their brash but ill-advised mid-brim offensive, suddenly the Empire's infinite pool of manpower was being stretched thin. Because even though there were plenty of people that could be recruited into the Empire, training them was quite difficult. Training someone to man a gun emplacement in an Imperial garrison in the Outer Rim takes just a few months. But training a pilot or a bridge officer was like getting a naval PhD. It could take up to four years sometimes. And the Galactic Civil War, well, it only lasted like five years. And what also started happening was the Galactic Empire desperately needed to fill in many of its bridge crew positions. And so they started taking TIE fighter pilots out of the squadrons, especially those with command experience, and placing them on the bridges of capital ships. Captain Sienna Ree is a good example of this, as was Captain Teresa Carell. Both of them went from TIE Fighter Ace to Star Destroyer Captain within a relatively short time, leaving the TIE Fighter Corps' pilot pool even more gutted than before. Kind of like the Japanese Imperial Navy in 44, they had lost so many of their experienced pilots that they were using their new recruits in kamikaze tactics. Now, when faced with this pilot shortage, the perfect solution for the Empire would have been to use unmanned platforms, like the Starfighters used by the Separatist Alliance Navy during the Clone Wars. Droid fighters, if you think about it, check a lot of the boxes that the Empire needed when it came to their Starfighter Corps. The TIE in-space superiority fighter might be one of the cheapest mass-produced starfighters in galactic history, but once you enter the unmanned category, you have the variable geometry self-propelled battle droid Mark I, which, get this, costs only 40,000 credits, or about two-thirds the price of a TIE fighter. And that's because the droid fighter doesn't need a bulky cockpit. They don't even need the TIE fighter's minimal life support system. They also don't need ejection seats. That's because there's no seat or control surfaces for that matter. And the only thing you need to protect in this case is the droid brain, which is made out of metal and circuitry and not, you know, a bag full of blood. This allows the vulture droid to be super maneuverable. Uh, the amount of G-forces that you can put on this fighter is not limited by a pilot's tolerance, the strength of the frame of the ship. The lack of a pilot also means the Vulture Droid can be smaller, faster, but at the same time have more room for fuel and munitions and weapons. At 6.96 meters, it was around the same length as a TIE Fighter, but with a height of just 1.86 meters, it was one-third as tall as the TIE. And with a width of 4.9 meters, it was about a meter thinner as well. That made this Vulture Droid an extremely small target to hit. The Vulture Droid also had two twin blaster cannons, energy torpedo launcher, along with a Buzz Droid missile, which was just terrifying and probably as hated by pilots as infantry and tankers hate landmines. The point is, the lack of a pilot gave the Vulture 
Ultra Droid a lot more firepower as well. The Droid Tri-Fighter, which was released later on during the Clone Wars, was even smaller, more maneuverable, faster, and far more vicious than the Vulture Droid. They were just 5.4 meters in length, with a width of just around 3.45 meters, which is about the length of an F-150 pickup truck and about 30% or so wider. The Tri-Fighter featured a much more advanced droid brain, which used heuristic processors. This gave the fighter the capability to assess, anticipate, and even learn and mimic enemy tactics. The Tri-Fighter, believe it or not, could actually beat an RZ one a wing at sublight speeds, making it probably the fastest starfighter of its era. It did this all with three individual vectoring engines, which is why it's even more maneuverable than the Vulture, and it had one heavy laser cannon supplemented with three light laser cannons, along with two flex ordnance launchers with up to six missiles of different configurations, including the dreaded proton torpedo and also a missile canister full of the deadly Pistoeca sabotage droids. This is probably the deadliest fighter of the entire Clone Wars, but it only saw action in the last two years. It was too late and it was rolled out in very small quantities. This droid was basically the result of an AI brain learning from millions of hours of actual dogfight footage between the Separatists and the Republic. And despite all of this, despite all the advanced features, this thing only cost 40,000 credits, the same as the Vulture droid. And like the TIE Fighter, these droids didn't have shields or hyperdrives. They actually ran on batteries and were pretty short-ranged. They could be deployed very easily on a Star Destroyer, both internally in the hangar and also externally. On paper, it really would have been the perfect fit. I mean, the Empire already uses TIE Fighters in gigantic swarms. Now they could do it with actual droid fighters who are programmed to work together and you know travel around in actual swarms. It would have been completely terrifying and demoralizing to face these fighters. And even though these droids were decades old by the time the Galactic Civil War started, they were still quite relevant and very dangerous. For instance, during the ambush of the Perilous on Ryloth, Cham Sandula and his resistance fighters collected a pretty decent amount of droid fighters along with landmines and buzz droids and used them to essentially take down Emperor Palpatine's Star Destroyer, the Perilous. I mean, they came this close to assassinating him. You would think especially after that incident or even when he was a chancellor witnessing the terrifying power of these droid fighters, he would have made a note about perhaps using them for his own future military force. In an earlier video, we talked about how the ARC-170 starfighter's poor performance during the Battle of Coruscant led Palpatine favoring a single-seater short interceptor design over something a bit larger like the ARC-170. But you know what made that income starfighter look so bad in the first place? It was the droid fighters. So why didn't the Imperial Navy use them? Well, it turns out there are several large problems. First, from an image point of view, this was just not a good idea. During the Republic period, Palpatine's Comcor political movement churned out tons of propaganda about the Separatists, and more importantly, the terrifying droids that swept across the galaxy, killing sentient beings without hesitation. And this meshed really well with the real-life sentiment that was pretty prevalent in the Outer Rim. A lot of people hated the Separatist droids because of all the damage they created during the Clone Wars. I mean, you guys have seen how Mando Bro acts around droids, right? If you don't start answering questions, I'll yank your memory circuit and dissect it back at the lab. That guy really needs counseling, but, you know, he's not the only one who shares his sentiment, especially, again, in the outer rim. This was a pretty prevalent uh, mindset. We don't serve their kind here. What? You're droids. They'll have to wait outside. We don't want them here. Like in Jaren, Wuhar also lost his parents to droids, but instead of being rescued by Mandalorian Death Watch, he was rescued by the Jedi. But yeah, a lot of people did not like droids. No, but you're droid. What? Some droids on Plazir date back to the Separatists. The New Republic would send them to scrap. So if Palpatine suddenly replaced all of his human pilots with droid pilots, I think there would be a lot of uproar in both the civilian side of the Empire and also in the military itself. I also think it'd be a lot harder for Imperial forces to do, you know, law enforcement and peacekeeping in the hyperspace lanes or just the regular space lanes with the droid fighter. I mean, people were terrified of these things. Plus, there was technically a ban on the creation of battle droids. The Empire got around this by designating units like the KX series as a security droid. The Vulture droid and the Tri Fighter would also have problems getting around these types of restrictions. The general trauma the galaxy had for battle droids is not something that would easily be overcome. It would take a lot of time for people to forget that trauma, and it would also probably take a lot of Imperial propaganda. Papatine also saw increasing the size of the Imperial military as an essential way to create jobs for Imperial citizens. A good portion of the galaxy was completely in ruins because of the Clone Wars. Uh, you had industry destroyed, you had entire professions destroyed, and you had a lot of people who were unemployed. And unemployed people are generally 
more likely to join rebellions or have the free time to you know, become politically active and such. Getting these people to join the imperial military would ensure a large percentage of the population were employed and taken care of by the central government, and therefore extremely loyal to his cause. The imperial navy and army both utilized indoctrination and had a culture of conformity that was quite successful at turning normal citizens into fanatic imperials. TIE fighter pilots were a special breed of imperials, smart, capable, courageous, and with quick reflexes. Replacing these pilots with, you know, droids, especially separatist droids, probably will piss them off as well. And without a proper way to allow them to continue flying, a good percentage of these pilots will most likely find their way to independent work or maybe working for a criminal syndicate or worse, some type of rebel movement. If you take a look at the early rebellion, pilots like Biggs, Darklighter, and Wedge Antilles were crucial in developing the Starfighter Corps' doctrine, and they also managed to train an entire generation of pilots. So the Empire really needed to keep these very skilled and dangerous individuals in check and happy. They needed a monopoly on their skills, basically. The second problem is manufacturing these droids were not as easy as you'd think. I mean, the end product might be cheap, but the R&D is ridiculous for these platforms. And that's because it's not just about designing the fighter itself, it's also about creating a pilot, AKA droid brain. The Vulture droid was created by Harchal Engineering Corporation, which was operated by Shi Char Cathedral Factories. They're one of the leading designers and engineers for starfighters in the galaxy, known for their, you know, very precise and creative work. Wraith Senior of Senior Fleet Systems actually trained with them or stole their industry secrets, depending on who you ask. The Shichar were actually an alien species that worshipped precision manufacturing. Like, they literally thought that building starships got them closer to their god, which again, created a very unique style of culture for this company. Unfortunately, that company did join the Separatist Alliance effort and was destroyed by the Republic towards the end of the Clone Wars. During the rise of the New Order, Senior Fleet Systems would simply absorb the remaining assets of the shipyard. This means a lot of the design team and technical know-how, especially the group that you know, invented the droid brain that operated the Vulture droid were all gone. The Empire had to rebuild or would have to rebuild an entire team to create these type of AI brains if it wanted to create a new generation of droid fighters. The droid tri-fighter was also manufactured by an alien corporation known as Colicoid Creation Ness. For one reason or another, insectoid hive mind species were really good at creating AI brains. And because of the Empire's anti-alien, you know, xenophobic policies. Such companies were not a natural fit for the military industrial complex. Colicoid Creation Ness was a part of the Techno Union, and that was nationalized and then broken apart by the Empire. While the assets for these companies were ultimately consumed by the Empire, the creative minds, the engineers, the design team were never incorporated. And so you lost a lot of the technical know-how how to build these droid fighters. In a way, the Empire threw away a lot of technology when it consumed a lot of these uh, larger shipbuilding companies. And so while the Empire could field and repair existing droid fighters in the galaxy, the knowledge to manufacture and upgrade these fighters had more or less been lost. And so that's our analysis on why the Empire couldn't use droid fighters in their Imperial Navy, even if they really wanted to, it just wasn't exactly an option. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.